many other uh, This is right, uh, Arab. Hello and welcome to We On live broadcast from London. I'm Laura Makin Isherwood and in this bulletin we're going to get you updates on stories developing around the world. First, let's take a look at the headlines. The death toll from the devastating floods in Europe soars to at least 108, most of them in western Germany where emergency responders are still searching frantically for missing people. quite clear that this, all these incidents of unrest and looting were instigated. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa says that the deadly violence and looting that shook the country over the past week was instigated and planned as the death toll in South Africa rises to 117. Embedded with the Afghan Special Forces to document the war, Danish Siddiqui, an Indian Pulitzer Prize winning Reuters photojournalist, has been killed in the Spinboldak district of Kandahar. Airstrikes in Afghanistan's Badakhshak province kills 20 Taliban terrorists, including a shadow deputy governor. Several of the group's weapons, ammunition and vehicles were destroyed in the attack. Pakistan Prime Minister Imran Khan and Afghan President Ashraf Ghani meet on the sidelines of the Central and South Asia 2021 conference in Tashkent. Delegation level talks are underway. Tennis world number one Novak Djokovic bucks the trend of big name pullouts and confirms his participation at the Tokyo Olympics. The Serbian is seeking a first ever Olympic gold, having won all three Grand Slams this year. Devastation, destruction and catastrophe. Severe flooding continues to wreak havoc in Germany. 93 people have died and hundreds more are missing, while thousands have been evacuated. Authorities are struggling to rescue around 1,300 people currently stranded. The scale of flooding and rainfall hasn't been witnessed in Europe in almost 100 years. And in the latest development, a deadly landslide has left several people dead in the Rhine-Westphalia area. The area remains the hardest hit. Authorities have confirmed that while some houses have been swept away, some have also collapsed. The death toll has now reached 43 there, up from 31. A state of emergency has been declared in Hagen, a city with a population of 180,000 people in North Rhine-Westphalia. The situation in Hagen worsened after the river burst its banks. Around 1,000 emergency services personnel have been drawn to help the hardest hit district. The German Chancellor, Angela Merkel, who's currently on a tour in the US, has expressed her sorrow.
friedliche Orte durchleben in diesen Peaceful places are experiencing a catastrophe in these hours. One can only say a tragedy. Heavy rain and flooding only describe this insufficiently. It is simply a catastrophe. I am shocked by the reports I am receiving from the towns underwater in which people in great need climbed onto their roofs to save themselves and hopefully will be rescued. I am grieving those who lost their lives in this catastrophe. We still don't know the number, but it will be many, some in basement of their houses, some as firemen attempting to bring others into safety. I extend my deep condolences to their family. This is how Germany looks after the devastating floods. Roads are inundated, streets have turned into streams, villages and even regions have been cut off after floodwaters and landslides, leaving the roads impassable while houses that have been left standing are now inhabitable. One night they were upstairs and it was dark because there was no, um, um, no light, no, st no uh, power. And um, yeah, there was also no phone connection, so we tried to get reach them all night and it was very hard. Um, to get them. Around 4 a.m. the water started rising from over there. I told my partner and we are able to move the car out and quickly move a few things upstairs. But then we had to go as the waters rose so quickly inside the house. As we left, the water was up to here on me. Rescue operations are being marred by the high speed of water. Operations are also being hampered by roads, phones and internet outages. At least 200,000 households in Western Germany have been left without electricity. Hundreds of people trapped in their houses are being evacuated from their rooftops. Helicopters from several states are flying over affected regions, trying to locate and rescue stranded people. The German military has deployed additional soldiers in many areas, with at least 850 soldiers now assisting the rescue operations. And the catastrophe is far from over. The water level in the Rhine River and its tributaries are continuing to rise dangerously. There's more rain forecast in several parts of Western Germany too. Germany's neighbours are also reeling from heavy floods. In Belgium, nine people have died due to the torrential rain and many more remain missing. Horrifying footage of devastation have emerged from Belgium. A 15-year-old girl went missing after being swept away by river waters. Drone footage showed the extent of flood damage in the small Belgian town of Esno, as heavy rainfall caused water levels to rise in large parts of the south of the country. The video on your screens shows cars submerged in water and flooded streets and shops in the Tilf area of the town. Flooded streets caused chaos in the Belgian city of Verviers after record rainfall in Western Europe caused rivers to burst their banks. Video and photos showed cars submerged by flood water with a line of vehicles becoming interlocked with one another on a main street. Downstream in the Netherlands, flooding rivers damaged many housing, houses in the southern province of Limburg. Houses were reduced to piles of debris and broken beams. Roads were blocked by wreckage and fallen trees. Dutch authorities were seen evacuating a care home for the elderly in the southern Netherlands too. Police and emergency responders evacuated the residents amid fears that essential supplies such as electricity and gas would break down. Brimming with confidence since the withdrawal of foreign troops from Afghanistan, the Taliban has unleashed unrelenting offensives and is capturing one district after the other. The group now claims to have control over 85 percent of Afghan territory. The terror group also has captured key border points. While the countryside witnesses fierce battles, cities are being cut off from accessing key supplies. The battlefield dominance is being used by the Taliban as a path to political and diplomatic power. The terror group is now believed to be setting conditions for a truce. With almost 95% troop withdrawal complete, terror group Taliban has conducted a staggering land-grabbing offensive. 
and the offensive seems to be aimed at forcing the Afghan government to either sue for peace on the terror group's terms or suffer a complete military defeat. For three months of ceasefire, the group wants 7,000 of its terrorists released. Not just this, Taliban also wants names of its top leaders to be removed from the United Nations blacklist. From Doha to Kabul, from conference tables to the battleground, Taliban is largely dictating when and where they will fight the government forces. We have completed a plan to retake the lost territories. Soon you will be the witnesses of our big achievements. While the Afghan forces claim that they have a plan set to regain lost territory, the ground reality tells a different tale. Afghan forces are struggling to halt Taliban's gains. They have besieged provincial capitals and stormed key border crossings. Taliban claims to control 85% of the districts across the country. You and the rest of the world probably know that 85% of Afghan territory has been taken over by the Islamic State. In fact, there are 394 districts in Afghanistan and over 200 of them are under the control of Islamic Emirates of Afghanistan. It even controls or contests all the border crossing points along Iran, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, China. The spin bowler crossing with Pakistan is witnessing a fierce battle between the Afghan forces and Taliban. A day after Taliban claimed to control the crossing, Afghan forces launched an air operation to regain control over the post. Afghan Defense Ministry says 20 terrorists were killed in the airstrike. As per the Independent Administrative Reform and Civil Service Commission, or the IARCSC, Taliban has destroyed and damaged infrastructure in 116 districts. Over 260 government buildings have either been torched or destroyed. Damage done by the group on state buildings is estimated to be around $500 million. 13 million Afghans have been deprived of social services in Taliban-controlled areas. 4,000 public service employees have evacuated their native areas because of threats of the Taliban. Over 3.5 million Afghans have been forced to flee their homes since January this year. Our belongings are all burnt and we have nothing left. Our houses are all punctured and most of the shots fired from the planes and other fronts hit our houses. We live under this old tent and the sun. The United Nations Refugee Agency has warned that Afghanistan is on the brink of a humanitarian crisis. On the country's side, Taliban has battered the morale of the security forces. For the cities, the terror group has adopted tactical means of attack. They're trying to choke off money and supplies to cities like Kabul. Taliban's strategy appears to be aimed at achieving multiple goals. Exhausting the country's overstretched air force and command units and depriving its cities of the much-needed revenue. The terror group now sees the battlefield dominance as a path to political and diplomatic power. And reversing Taliban's momentum is extremely crucial for the Afghan government now more than ever. Bureau report, we on, world is one. Earlier this year, China urged a political solution in Afghanistan should be found. Beijing had asked Britain to investigate its soldiers for alleged war crimes in Afghanistan. But tensions now seem to have mellowed as the government's concern shifts to saving its own territory. The withdrawal of U.S. troops from Afghanistan will open a strategic door to China as the country is full of both risk and opportunity. Maintaining stability after decades of war in its western neighbor will be Beijing's paramount consideration. But if stability requires a Taliban-dominated government, such an administration might provide 
wide support to Muslim separatists in China's Xinjiang region. Analysts say for China, the risk does not come from who holds the power in Afghanistan, but from the risk of persistent instability. Afghanistan shares a small 76-kilometer border with China at high altitude and without a road crossing point. The Wakhan Corridor is a big concern because it runs alongside Xinjiang, and Beijing fears it's being used as a staging ground for Uyghur separatists. Million of Uyghurs and other mostly Muslim minorities have been placed in Xinjiang camps, where it's alleged they are being subjected to forced labor and sterilization. China has responded defiantly to a chorus of international condemnation over the camps by signing deals with the Taliban. Beijing hopes they will also remain publicly neutral on the Uyghur issue. While China has not called on President Joe Biden to reverse the military withdrawal, statements by senior Chinese officials made it clear that they would blame the United States for any insecurity that spreads in the region. On the other hand, Beijing has made political capital out of the American troop withdrawal and has warned that Afghanistan could again become the region's powder keg and a haven for terrorism. But should the Taliban seize Afghanistan, Beijing sees financial investment as a way to shore up support. A stable and cooperative administration in Kabul would pave the way to an expansion of China's Belt and Road Initiative into Afghanistan. The Taliban would meanwhile consider China a crucial source of investment and economic support, either directly or via Pakistan, the insurgents' chief regional patron and a close Beijing ally. In possibly her final visit to the White House before stepping down in September, Germany's Chancellor Angela Merkel met U.S. President Joe Biden to strengthen ties between the two nations. The transatlantic ties suffered under the tenure of former U.S. President Donald Trump. Though Merkel and Biden placed an emphasis on friendship, the two leaders agreed to disagree on Russia's Nord Stream 2 natural gas gas pipeline. But both leaders agreed that Moscow must not be allowed to use energy as a weapon to coerce its neighbours. In what may likely be her last visit to Washington as German Chancellor, Angela Merkel and U.S. President Joe Biden on Thursday vowed to work together to defend against Russian aggression and stand up to anti-democratic actions by China. Biden reiterated his concerns about the Nord Stream 2 pipeline being built from Russia to Germany under the Baltic Sea, but he and Merkel were united in their belief that Russia should not use energy as a weapon. We stand together and will continue to stand together to defend our eastern flank allies at NATO against Russian aggression. During the joint news conference at the White House, Biden said both countries would stand up for democratic principles and universal rights when they saw China or any other country working to undermine a free and open society. The situation in Hong Kong has deteriorated and the Chinese uh, government uh, is not keeping its commitment that it made, how it would deal with with Hong Kong. And so it is more of an advisory as to what may happen in on Hong Kong. It's as simple as that and as complicated as that. During talks in the Oval Office earlier in the day, Biden called Merkel a great friend and said cooperation between the U.S. and Germany is strong and enduring, a sentiment echoed by Merkel. I'd like to say here how much I value friendship with the United States of America. I am more than aware of the contribution of America to a free and democratic Germany. Merkel, who has served as chancellor since 2005 and worked with four U.S. presidents during her tenure, plans to exit Germany's government after national elections in September. Thousands of flamingos were found dead on the dry bed of Turkey's Lake Tuz. Drone footage from the area showed hundreds of flamingos partially buried in dried parts of the lake in central Turkey. The site has alarmed environmentalists and has prompted authorities to investigate what caused the mass deaths. Experts believe the deaths stemmed from the agricultural irrigation practices in the region, along with the repercussions of climate change and drought.
there seem to be as many as 1,000 dead Fleminglets. According to the analysis conducted by the Veterinary School of Silkak University, there is no sign of poisoning. With less water and increased concentration ratio in the water, we observe deaths of Fleminglets which are unable to fly. How are we going to prevent the deaths of flamingos? There is only one way to do it, and that is to change our false agricultural irrigation policy. You and the rest of the world probably know that 85% of Afghan territory has been taken over by the Islamic State. The Director General of the World Health Organization has urged China to be more transparent on the raw data about the origins of coronavirus. Concerns have been raised that investigations into the origins of COVID-19 and the pandemic in China were being hampered by a lack of available raw data on initial days of spread. It comes as calls grow for a probe into the origins of the virus to be launched. We are asking actually China to be transparent, open and cooperate. The head of the World Health Organization on Thursday said that investigations into the origins of the COVID-19 pandemic in China were being hampered by the lack of raw data on the first days of spread there and urged the country to be more transparent. WHO Director General Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus also said there was a premature push to ignore the theory that the virus may have escaped from a Wuhan laboratory. Uh, there was a premature push to, um, uh, you know, uh, especially uh, reduce one of the uh, options like the lab theory. As you know, I was uh, a lab technician myself. I'm an immunologist and I have worked in the lab and lab accidents happen. It's common. I have seen it happening. And I had, I myself had errors, so it can, it can happen. And we need information, direct information on what the situation of these labs was before and at the start of the pandemic. A joint report in March by a WHO-led team that spent four weeks in and around Wuhan with Chinese researchers said that the virus had probably been transmitted from bats to humans through another animal. It said that the laboratory leak theory was extremely unlikely, but other countries, including the United States and some scientists, have not been satisfied with that conclusion. China has called the lab leak theory absurd and said repeatedly that politicizing the issue will hinder investigations. I think we owe it to the millions who suffered and to the millions who died really to understand uh, what happened. And I hope there will be better cooperation. Tedros will brief the WHO's 194 member states on Friday regarding a proposed second phase of study to research the origins of the COVID-19 pandemic. In June this year, the International Olympic Committee announced an expanded refugee team of 29 athletes will compete across 12 sports at the Tokyo Games. The team includes athletes from Syria, South Sudan, Eritrea, Afghanistan and Iran. The athletes will compete under the Olympic flag and are revving up for the Games. It is a teamwork to see that uh, uh, kids with uh, displaced background have the right to compete like any other. So today our athletes are athletes, not like when they went to Rio. Now they are competing because of time.
I used to tell myself that one day, one time, I will travel with the aeroplane in various places, but I never knew that what will make me to travel. I never, I just know that one day, one time, I'm going to travel. But now it happened in 2016 that I traveled to Brazil and competed international Olympic. Then I realized that, oh, I have a talent that can take me far. For me, it was really, really, I was really, really happy for it. Well, that's all we have time for on this edition of We On Live broadcast from London. But for more global news and updates, stay tuned to We On. World is one.